There are many constants in the storage business, relentlessly declining cost per bit, innovations that perpetually battle the laws of physics, a seemingly endless flow of venture capital, despite the intense competition. And there's one other constant in the storage business, Eric Herzog. And he joins us today in this CUBE video exclusive to talk about IBM's recent storage announcements. Eric, welcome back to the CUBE. Great, Dave, thank you very much. We love being on the CUBE and you guys do a great job of informing the industry about what's going on in storage and IT in general. Well, great thank you job. for that. We're going to cover a lot of ground today. IBM Storage, you made a number of announcements uh, 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 this, the past month around data resilience, um, a new as a service model, uh, which a lot of folks are doing in the industry. You've made performance enhancements. Can you give us the top line summary of the hard news, Eric? Sure, the top line summary is of course, cybersecurity is on top of mind for everybody. In the recent Fortune 500 list that came out, uh, you probably saw there was a survey of CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. They named cybersecurity as their number one concern. Not war, not pandemic, but cybersecurity. Okay, so we've got an announcement around data resilience and cyber resiliency built on our flash system family with our new offering, Safeguarded Copy. And the second thing is the move to a new method of storage consumption. Storage as a service, a pay as you go model, cloud-like, the way people buy cloud storage, that's what you can do now from IBM storage with our storage as a service. Those are the key two takeaways, Dave. Yeah, and I want to I want to stay on the, the trends that we're seeing in, in cyber for a moment. The, the work from home pivot and the hybrid work approach has really created new exposures. Uh, people aren't as secure outside of the, the, the walled garden of the, of the offices. And we've seen a dramatic escalation in the adversary's capabilities and techniques, uh, not the least of which is island hopping. In other words, putting code fragments in the digital supply chain. They reform once they're inside the company and it's almost like this organic creepy thing that, that occurs. Uh, they're also, living, as you know, stealthily for many, many months, sometimes years, exfiltrating data, and then just waiting. And then when companies respond, the incident's response trigger a ransomware incident. So they, they escalate the cyber crime, and it's just a really, really bad situation for, for victims. What are you seeing in that regard in the trends? Well, one of the key things we see is everyone is very concerned about cybersecurity. The Biden administration has issued uh, victims, not only to the government sector, but to the private sector, cybersecurity is a big issue. Other governments across the world have done the same thing. So at IBM Storage, what we see is taking a comprehensive view. Many people think that cybersecurity is the moat with the alligators, the castle wall, and then of course the Sheriff of Nottingham to catch the bad guys. And we know the Sheriff of Nottingham doesn't do a good job of catching Robin Hood. So it takes a while, as you just pointed out, sitting there for months or even longer. So one of the key things you need to do in an overall cybersecurity strategy is don't forget storage. Now our announcement around safeguarded copy is very much about rapid recovery after an attack for malware or ransomware. We have a much broader set of cybersecurity technology inside of IBM storage. For example, with our flash system family, we can encrypt data at rest with no performance penalty. So if someone steals that data, guess what? It's encrypted. We can do anomalous pattern detection with our backup product, Spectrum Protect Plus. Why would you care? Well, if the cube's backup was taking two hours on particular data sets, and all of a sudden it was taking four hours, hmm, maybe someone is encrypting those backup data sets. And so we notify. So what we believe at IBM is that an overarching cybersecurity strategy has to keep the bad guys out, okay? Threat detection, anomalous pattern behavior on the network, on the servers, on the storage, and all of that, uh, chasing the bad guy down once they've breached the wall, because that does happen. But if you don't have cyber and data resilience built into your storage technology, you are leaving a gap that the bad guys can exploit, whether that be the malware or ransomware guys, or by the way, Dave, there still is internal IT theft. In fact, there was a case about 10 years ago now where 10 IT guys stole $175 million, I kid you not, $175 million from a bunch of large banks across the country. And that was an internal IT theft. So between the internal IT issues that could approach you, malware and ransomware, a comprehensive cybersecurity strategy must include storage. 
So I want to ask you about, uh, come, come back to Safeguard Copy, and, and uh, you mentioned some, some features, some capabilities, encrypting data at rest, uh, your anomalous pattern uh, recognition. I'm, I'm inferring you're taking a holistic approach, but of course you've got you know, a storage centricity. What's different right. about your cyber solution? What, what's your unique value prop relative to your company? Well, when you look at Safeguarded Copy, what it does is it creates immutable copies that are logically air-gapped, but logically air-gapped locally. So what that means is if you have a malware or ransomware attack and you need to do a recovery, whether it be a surgical recovery or a full on recovery because they attacked everything, then we can do recovery in a couple hours versus a couple days or a couple weeks. Now, in addition to the logical local air gapping with safeguarded copy, you also could do remote logical air gapping by snapping out to the cloud, which we also have on our flash system products. And you also, of course, could take our flash system products and back up to take giving you a physical air gap. In short, we give our customers three different ways to help with malware and ransomware. Let me ask you. Air gap locally, right? Yeah, please continue, I'm sorry. So our air gapping locally for rapid recovery, air gapping remotely, which again then puts it on the cloud provider network. So hopefully they can't breach that. And then clearly a physical air gap going out to take. All three, and on the mainframe, we have safeguarded copy already, Dave, and several of our mainframe customers actually do two of those things. They'll do safeguarded copy for rapid recovery locally, but they'll also take that safeguarded copy and either put it out to tape or put it out to a cloud provider with a remote logical air gap using a snapshot. I want to ask you a question about management, because when you ask CISOs what's your number one challenge, they'll say lack of talent. We, so we got all these tools, all this, you know, we lack of skills to really do all this stuff, can't hire people you know, fast enough and they don't have this, the skills. So when you think about, and, and so what you do is you bring a lot of automation in, into the orchestration and management. My question right. is this, when you set up air gaps, do you recommend, or what do you see in terms of, not, of logically and physically, not only physically separating the data, but also, the management and orchestration and automation, does that have to be you know, logically air-gapped as well or can you use the same management system? What's the best practice there? Ah, so what we do is we work with our uh, copy management software, which will manage regular copies as well, but safeguarded copies are immutable. You can't write to them, okay? You can't get rid of them and they're logically air-gapped from the local hosts. So the hosts, want, for the safeguarded copies, that immutable copy you just made, the hosts don't even know that it's there. So you manage that with our copy management software, which by the way, will manage regular snapshots and replicas as well. But what that allows you to do is allows you to automate. For example, you could automate recovery. Across multiple flash system arrays, the copy services manager will allow you to set different parameters for different safeguarded copies. So a certain safeguarded copy you could say, make me a copy every four hours. And then on another volume, on a different data set, you could say, make me a copy every 12 hours. Once you set all that stuff up, Dave, it's completely automated, completely automated. So I want to come back to something you mentioned about anomalous pattern recognition and, 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 and how you help with threat detection. So a couple, couple multi-part question here. First of all, mm -hmm. the, the backup corpus is an obvious target. Uh, so that's, that's an area that you have to protect. Um, and, and so, uh, can, and you're saying, okay, you use the example if your backup's taking too long. But so, how do you do that? What's the technology behind that? And, ah, then, and sure. then, can you? And then, can you go beyond? Should you go beyond just the backup corpus? You know, with primary data or you know copies, you know, you know, on prem, right, et cetera. Right. Two part right. question there. So when we look at it, um, the anomalous pattern detection is part of our backup software, say uh, Spectrum Protect. And what it does, it uses AI-based technology, it recognizes the pattern. So it knows that the backup data set for the queue takes two hours and it recognizes that and it sees that as the normal state of events. So if all of a sudden that backup that the queue was doing used to take two hours and starts taking four, what it does is that's an anomalous pattern. It's not a normal pattern. It'll send a note to the backup admin, the storage admin, whoever you designate it to and say, the backup data set for the cube that used to take two hours has taken four hours. You probably ought to check that, okay? So when we view cyber resiliency from a storage perspective, it's broad. We just talked about anomalous pattern detection in Spectrum Protect. 
we were talking most of the conversation about our safeguarded copy, which is available on the mainframe for several years and is now available on flash systems, making immutable local air-gapped copies that can be rapidly recovered and are immutable and can help you recover from malware ransomware attack. Our data rest encryption happens to be with no performance penalty. So when you look at it, you need to create an overarching strategy for cybersecurity. And then when you look at your storage estate, you need to look at your secondary storage, backup, replicas, snaps, archive, and have a strategy there to protect that. And then you need a strategy to protect your primary storage, which would be things like safeguarded copy and encryption. So then you put it all together. And in fact, Dave, one of the things we offer is a free cyber resilience assessment. It's not only for IBM storage, but it happens to be a cyber resilience assessment that conforms to the NIST framework and it's heterogeneous. So it's, if you're a big company, you've got IBM, EMC and HPE storage, guess what? It's all about the data sets, not about the storage. So we say, you said these 10 data sets are critical. Why are you not encrypting them? Okay, these data sets are X, Y, Z. Why are you not air gapping them? So we come up based on the NIST framework a set of recommendations that are not IBM specific, but they are storage specific. Here's how you make your storage more resilient, both your secondary storage and your primary storage. That's how we see the big thing in safeguarded copy, of course, fits in on the primary storage side, A, on the mainframe, which we've had for several years now, and B, in the Linux world, the Unix world, and the Windows Server world on our Flash system portfolio with the announcement we did on July 20th. Great, thank you for, for painting that picture. Eric, are you seeing any use case patterns emerge in this space? Uh, well, we see a couple things. First of all is, A, most resellers and most end users don't see storage as an overarching part of the cybersecurity strategy and that's starting to change. Second thing we're seeing is more and more storage companies are trying to get into this bailiwick of offering cyber and data resilience. Um, the value IBM brings, of course, is much longer experience to that. And we even integrate with other products. So for example, IBM offers a product called QRadar from the security division, it's not a storage product, security product. And it helps you with early data breach recognition. So it looks at servers, network access, right? It looks at the storage and it actually integrates now with our safeguarded copy. So, you know, part of the value that we bring is this overarching strategy of A, comprehensive data and cyber resilience across our whole portfolio, including safeguarded copy, our July 20th announcement, but also integration beyond storage now with our QRadar product from IBM's security division. And there will be future announcements coming in both Q4 and Q1 of additional integration with other security technologies. So you can see how storage can be a vital cog in the corporate cybersecurity strategy. Got it, Th thank you. Let's pivot to the as a service. Uh, it's a, you know, sure. cloud obviously is brought in that, that uh, as a service. Um, it, it, you know, it seems like everybody has one now. Uh, you guys have announced obviously HPE, Dell, Lenovo, Cisco, Pure, everybody's got now their as a service model. What do we need to know about your as a service solution and why is it different from the others? Sure, well, one of the big differences is we actually go on actual storage, not effective. So when you look at effective storage, um, which most of them do, that includes creating the RAID data sets and other things. So you're basically paying for that. Second thing we do is we have a bigger margin. So for example, if the cube says we want SLA three and we sell it by the SLA, Dave, SLA one, two, and three. So let's say the cube needs SLA three and the minimum capacity is hundred terabytes. But let's say you think you need 300 terabytes, no problem. You also have a variable. One of the key differences is unlike many of our competitors, the rate for the base and the rate for the variable are identical. Several of our competitors, when you're in the base, you pay a certain amount. When you go into the variable, they charge you a premium. The other key differentiator is around data reduction. Some of our competitors and all storage companies have data reduction technology, right? Block level dedupe, thin provisioning, compression, right? We all offer those features. The difference is with IBM's pay as you grow, storage as a service model, if you have certain data sets that are not very dedupable, not very compressible, we absorb that. 
with our competitors, most of them, if the data set is not easily dedupable, compressible, and they don't see the value, they actually charge you a premium for that. So that is a huge difference. And then last big difference is our 100% availability guarantee. We have that on our flash system product line. We're the only one offering 100% availability guarantee. We also, against many of the competitors, offer a better base nines, as you know, availability characteristics. We offer six nines of availability, which is five minutes and 26 seconds of downtime and the 100% availability off offering. Some of our competitors only offer four nines of availability. And if you want five or six, they charge you extra. We give you six nines base in, which is only five minutes and change of downtime in a year. So those are the key difference between us and the other as a service models out there. So I mean, the basic concept I think, right, is if you commit to more and, 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 and buy more, you pay less per, right? I mean, that's the basic philosophy of these things, right? So yes. if, if I commit to you X, let's say I want to just sort of start small and I commit to you to X and okay, great. I'm in now in, in uh, maybe I sign up for a, a multi-year term. Uh, I commit this much, whatever, how, 100 terabytes, whatever the, the minimum is. And then I can say, hey, you know what? This is working for me. My CFO likes it. Um, and and the, the, the IT guys can provision more seamlessly. We got our chargeback or showback model. I want to now make a bigger commitment. And I, can, and I want to sort of, can I break my three year term and come back and then renegotiate, you know, kind of like reserved instances, maybe bigger and pay less. How do you approach that? Well, what, what you do is we do a couple of things. First of all, you could always add additional capacity. Okay, you just call up, we assign a technical account manager to every account. So in addition to what you get from the regular sales team and what you get from our valued business partners, by the way, we did factor in the business partners, Dave, into this. So business partners will have a great pay as you go storage as a service solution that includes partners and their ability to leverage. In fact, several of our partners that do have both MSP and MHP businesses are working right now to leverage our storage as a service and then add on their own value with their own MSP and MHP um, capabilities. And they can white label that, is that right? Or, or... Yeah, yeah, well, you'd still have storage as a service from IBM. They would resell that to the cube and then they'd add in their own MHP or MSP. Got that it. said, if the partner is interested in doing a white label, we would certainly uh, entertain that Got it. Uh, capability. I, I interrupted so, you, C carry yeah, on please. So you can go ahead and add more capacity, not a problem. You also could change the SLA. So the Q, one of the leading a in industry analyst firms, you've bought every analyst firm in the world and you're using IBM storage as a service, the pay as you go cloud-like model. So what you do is you call up the technical account manager and say, Eric, we bought all these other companies, they're using on-prem storage. We'd like to move to storage as a service for all the companies we acquired. We can do that, so that would up your capacity. And then you could say, now we've been at um, SLA two, but because we're adding all these new applications or workloads from our acquired companies, we want some of it to be at SLA one. So we can have some of your workloads on SLA two, others on SLA one. You could switch everything to SLA one and you just call your technical account manager and they'll make that happen for you or your business partner, obviously, if you bought through the channel. All right, I got the hard question is what if, what if all those other companies the Cube acquired are also IBM storage as a service uh, 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 customers? Can, can I, what, what's that discussion like? Hey, can I consolidate those and yeah, get a better would, deal? We, yeah, if they're all storage as a service customers, and Dave, I love that thought, um, we would just figure out a way to consolidate the agreement. The agreements are one through five years. One thing also that's very unique is let's say for whatever reason, and we all love finance people, let's say, the IT guys have called up finance and said, we did a one-year contract, we now like to do a three-year contract. The one year is coming up and guess what? Finance is delayed for whatever reason, the PO doesn't go through. So the ITI calls up the technical account manager says, we love your service, it's delayed in finance. We will let them stay on their storage as a service even though they don't have a contract. Now, of course, they've told us they want to do one, but if they exceed the contract by a quarter or two because they can't get you know, the finance guys or messing with the IT guys, that's fine. One of the key differentiators, exactly the same price. Some of our competitors will also extend without a contract, but until you do a contract, they charge you a premium. We do not. Whatever, if you're at SLA three, you're at SLA three, we'll extend you and no big deal. 
right? And then you do your contract, you know, when the finance guys get their act together and you're ready to go. So that is something we can do and we'll do on a continual basis. Last question, um, let's go way out. So, you know, we're not doing any kind of near-term forecasts. I'm trying to understand how popular you think as a service is going to be. I mean, if you think about the end of the decade, let's think industry total, you know, one of mm -hmm. the IBM specific. How, how popular do you think as a service models will be? Do you think it will be the majority of the transacted business or it's kind of more of a, just one of many? So I think there will be many, okay. Some people will still have bare metal on premises. Some people will still do virtualization on premises or in a hybrid cloud configuration. What I do think though is storage as a service will be over 50% by the end. Remember we're sitting at 2021. So we're talking now 2029. Right. So I think storage as a service will be over 50%. I think most of that storage as a service will be in a hybrid cloud model. I think the days of 100% cloud, which is the way it started, I think a lot of people realize that 100% cloud actually is more expensive than a hybrid cloud or, or fully on-prem. Uh, I was at a major uh, university in New York. Uh, they are in the healthcare space. And I know their CIO from one of my past lives I was talking to him. They did a full-on analysis of all the cloud providers going 100% cloud. And their analysis showed that 100% cloud, particularly for highly transactional workloads, was 50% more expensive than buying it, paying the maintenance and paying their employees. So he did an all in view. So what I think it's going to be is storage as a service will be over 50%. I think most of that storage as a service will be in a hybrid cloud configuration with storage on prem or in a colo, like what our IBM pay as you go service will do. And then it'll be um, accessed and available through a hybrid cloud configuration with IBM cloud, Google, Amazon, Azure, whoever the cloud provider is. So I do think that you're looking at over 50% of the storage being as a service, but I do think the bulk of that as a service will be as a service through someone like IBM or our competitors. And then part of it will be from the cloud providers. But I do think you're going to see a mix because right now the expense of going 100% cloud storage is dramatically understated. And when someone does analysis like that major university in New York did, they had a guy from finance help them do the analysis and it was 50% more expensive than doing on-premises, either on-prem or on-prem as a service. Both were way cheaper. Okay, but you own the asset, right? In the, in the, yes, in the as we, a service model. Okay, we, but so, and yeah, I would bet, I would bet that over the lifetime value, uh, uh, the, the, the spend in an as a service model, for, just like the cloud, if you do this with, with IBM or any other your, your competitors, I would bet that overall you're going to spend more, just like you're saying in the cloud, but you get, the benefit is the flexibility that you get. Yeah, yeah. if you compare it to the, so obviously the number one model would be to buy. That's probably going to be the least expensive. Right. Okay? But it's also the least flexible. Then you also have leasing, right? More flexibility, but leasing usually is more expensive. Just like when you lease your car, if you add up all the lease payments and then you, you know, at the end, pay that balloon payment to buy, it's cheaper to buy the car up front than it is to lease a car. Same thing with any IT asset. Now storage, Network servers, all are available on leasing. The net net is at the bottom line. That's more than buying it up front. And then storage as a service will also be more expensive than buying it up front, but ultimate capability, altering SLAs, adding new capacity, being able to handle and up very quickly. We can provision the storage. As you mentioned, the IT guys can easily provision. We provision the storage in 10 minutes. If you bought from IBM storage or any competitor and you bought and you need more storage, A, you got to put a PO through your system. And if you're not the cube, but you're a giant global fortune 500, sometimes it takes weeks to get the PO done. Then the PO has to go to the business partner. The business partner has got to give a PO to the distributor and a PO to IBM. So it can take you weeks to actually get the additional storage that you need, okay? With storage as a service from IBM with our pay as you go cloud-like model, all you have to do is provision and you're done. And by the way, we provide a 50% overage for free. So if they end up needing more storage, that 50% is actually sitting on-prem already. And if they get to 75% utilization of the total amount of storage, we then call them up, the technical account manager would call them up and their business partner and say, Dave, do you know that you guys are already at 75% full? We'd like to come add some additional storage to get you back down to a 50% margin. And by the way, most of our competitors only do a 25% margin. So again, another differentiator for IBM storage as a service. What about, I said last question, but I have another question. What about day one? Like how long does it take if I want to start fresh? 
with as a service? Uh, How long yeah, does it yeah. take to get up and running? Uh, basically, uh, you put the PO through, right? Whatever yep. it takes on your side or through your business partner. We then will sign the technical account manager. We'll call you up because you need to tell us, do you want it in a colo facility that you're working with or do you want to put it on on-prem? And then once we do that, we just schedule a time through your RT guys to do the install. So, you know, probably two weeks. Yeah, okay. It all, it, all, it all depends because you've got to call back and say, Eric, we'd like it at our colo partner. Our colo partner is ABC. We got to call ABC and then get back to you. Or on-prem, okay, we're going to have guys in the office a good day when it's not going to be too busy. Could you come two weeks from Thursday, which now would be three weeks for sake of argument. But that would be, you know, we interface with the customer, with the technical account manager to do it on your schedule, on your time, whether you do it in your own facility or use a colo provider. Yeah, but once you tell, once I tell you, once we get through all that stuff, it's two weeks from, from when, when that's all yeah. agreed. It's like the Xerox copier salesman. <laughs> where are you going to put it? Once you, once you decide where you're going to put it, then it's a couple of weeks. It's not a, it's not a month right. or two it, months. No, or, it's yeah. not. And when you need additional capacity, remember there's a 50% margin sitting there. So if you need to go into the variable and use it, and when we hit 75%, uh, we actually track it with our uh, Storage Insights Pro. So we'll call you up and say, Dave, you're at 76%. We'd like to add more storage to give you better margin of extra storage. And he would say, great, when can we do it? So you know, we're proactive about that to make sure that you stay at that 50% margin. Again, our competitors all do to only a 25% margin. So uh, we're giving you that better margin, a larger margin, in case you really have a high capacity demand for that quarter. Um, and we proactively will call you up if we think you need more based on uh, monitoring your storage usage. Great. Eric, got to go. Thank you so much for taking us through that. Great detail. Really appreciate it. Always good to see you. Great. Thanks, Dave. Really appreciate it. All right. And thank you for watching this CUBE conversation. This is Dave Vellante, and we'll see you next time.